Yeah, that's right, Michelle. A lot of nerve-wracking situation happening up here in Mount Vernon, but the city has been doing a lot to take care of that. And part of what they're doing to take care of that is adding these metal slats here in the downtown area just beyond the river walk. You can actually see the Skagit River. It's rising a little bit as we go, and it will continue to rise. And something like this is an investment the city is happy they've already started putting in place. Glad to see that they are prepared for it. Mike Haffey has lived in Mount Vernon for about 70 years, and this is the first time he's seeing this important work done in person. When I was in my younger days, we'd be doing the sandbags and stuff, but uh, yeah, that takes this wall takes a lot of that off there. The wall he's talking about is this retaining wall that goes along the Skagit River to block rising floodwaters from blanketing downtown Mount Vernon. All day, city crews have been at work putting those metal bars in place because it's expected that the Skagit will reach major flood stage by tomorrow morning. And on top of that, the water will keep rising another four to five feet, nearly topping an old record that was set over 30 years ago. We're closely monitoring the weather. We're watching river levels. Peter Donovan with the city says it's important to get this work done early. So if there's an emergency or something surprising happens, they aren't left scrambling to prepare for potential flooding. Just ensuring that that flood protection is in place for our downtown businesses. Because Haffey says the river is nothing to mess with. It's scary. I mean, it comes up, especially when the stuff comes down and everything. Despite the flood wall in place, Happy still has to worry about what this week will bring because he lives west of the Skagit. Protects the town, but I'm on the other side of the river. He says the last time the river nearly got to his house was 1990, the year that record-setting flood happened. Came within two, two inches of coming in the house. Just keep an eye on it and watch it and be prepared. But I'm like holding on. I can't fight against the current anymore. So after like 10 seconds, I like let go and like pray for the best. Developing now after a dramatic rescue from a raging storm drain, two boys are home safe in Federal Way. Really scary. And one of the boys' moms is now calling for safety measures so it doesn't happen to any other kids. Como's Tammy Mutasa reports from Federal Way with the latest. Good evening. Everybody is calling this a miracle. The water behind me was deeper and more deceptive than the boys thought when they got sucked into that storm drain. And tonight you can see the signs saying keep out, but the family say more needs to be done. So it was just so scary. Just like thinking about it just makes my legs kind of shaky. One day after Elijah's life was spared, the 11 year old is reliving his harrowing experience after he and his friend were sucked into the storm drainage tube. The kids had been tossing rocks in a storm pond when they fell in and got swept underwater by the force of the current. It was pretty scary. It <laughs> Like, I thought I was going to die holding on to, like, the entrance of the tube. His mom is grateful for just bumps and bruises instead of what could have happened. And I sat down and prayed and thanked God for his protection. Just grips my heart, you know, that I could have lost my son. Elijah says they held on for dear life in the drain until two officers made the dramatic rescue. I wasn't floating. I actually had to, like, swim up and grab my friend's leg. First responders say if the boys had been carried away past the drain, the outcome would have been very different. Christine is thankful to the officers who saved the boys' lives. She is calling for more safety measures around the storm drain, like fencing or a grate. Especially for kids that don't see what that would be. I think most of the time when it's not raining hard, it's probably not water there where people don't really think about the potential dangers on seasons like this. I asked Kitts Corner Apartment Complex who owns the property. They told me no comment. I asked the city the same question. They sent me this email saying, we're thankful for our outstanding first responders who are quick on the scene to help the two young men. Pending further review, the city has no further comments at this time. As for Elijah, he says he's also learned his lesson too. Don't go near like bodies of water that lead to um, drainage pipes. Elijah's mom tells me crews were out here surveying this area, but it's still unclear what changes, if any, will be done. For now, in Federal Way, Temi Mutasa, Como News. Mary, for the Boys and Girls Club, the goal is not to turn away any kids. And boy, have they been getting a lot of phone calls from parents in the hospital, parents who are working. And now they're all wondering if this is going to be happening again. When I say the phone has been ringing off the hook, that is no exaggeration. Parents 
parents, desperate to find a last-minute backup plan for their kids, have been looking to the Boys and Girls Club for help. CEO Tim Motts is also a parent of three in Bellevue schools. We need to make sure that kids have a safe place to go, not only my three kids, but the thousands of other kids in Bellevue. The Boys and Girls Club in Bellevue expects more than 750 kids to walk through their doors tomorrow after staffing shortages for school cancellations in Bellevue, Seattle, and Kent. Staff is getting facilities ready and working to secure meals. Now we're in the main game room at the Boys and Girls Club of Bellevue that'll be open this Friday for kids. The districts say a record number of staff are taking leave Friday after the federal holiday. A statewide shortage of substitute teachers is leaving districts stretched thin. As stressed out as it is for me, I do know that I'm one of the lucky ones and I really feel for the families who don't have options. There's no backup plan at all. In Seattle, working mom Sarah Eisen had to cancel work appointments to stay with her twin boys. What are you doing? Sleeping. One has special needs. He already lost a teacher in the vaccine mandate. Now this. And you're talking about the most vulnerable population. And it's not like you can just put anybody in these classrooms. So I'm concerned that Luke's not getting any kind of education right now. And it's really upsetting. They worry the staffing shortages will become a common occurrence in the future. Boy, if this becomes an ongoing challenge, what can the Boys and Girls Club do? What can local school districts do, really educators in general? How can we figure out a solution to make sure that the kids aren't the ones who suffer? Yeah, both times, Stephen. You could just hear the exhaustion in Joe Batch's voice. He works at the 7-Eleven on Finney Avenue North, came into work about 15 minutes early today and saw that his store had been ransacked for the second time in about a month. It's devastating, honestly, you know, I'm just trying to have a normal job. But rather than making coffee and counting the till to start his workday, 7-Eleven associate Joe Batch was calling police after two people drove a car into the front of his store and stole all of their tobacco products. You know, beer's heavy to carry, so they went for the lightest, most expensive thing, tobacco. According to Batch, after looking at surveillance video, he claims two men grabbed a trash bag from the gas pumps of the 7-Eleven to throw all the tobacco in there. He says they were in and out in less than a minute. And in the daylight, hours into his shift, you could still see the glass shattered and the front door bent open. Devastating to see that my city where I grew up has turned to this. And to Batch, it's especially frustrating when one of these windows had already been repaired about a month ago after the store had been broken into and someone stole, once again, all of their tobacco products. They used a small rock and just broke one window. They're trying to get what they can get, anything. It's not food. In the meantime, Batch says they've called corporate 7-Eleven to work on putting up plywood and replacing these windows, all the while hoping this is the last time he has to make that call to police. Sal's a great city. It's just sad to see this element happening. Hi everyone, I'm Preston Phillips from Como News. Thanks for checking out the Como YouTube channel. You can see more of our videos right here by clicking on the video links for more news from the Seattle area and Western Washington. Oh, and don't forget to click the subscribe button below so you don't miss our YouTube updates.